Hello there Digital World, welcome back once again to another episode of Spliced In Later. It is movie review time, the first of two coming at you this week. It's the first week of May and that's always exciting because it officially kicks off the summer movie blockbuster events. Or if you're here in Australia, the freezing cold winter events. In America, you get to go out on lovely evenings with the sun still up and check out all these cool movies. Here in Australia, you have to go out in the freezing cold and hope that your car isn't frozen by the end of the movie you're seeing because movies these days are minimum two hours, maximum four hours. But that being said, I'm very excited for it because it's all the big stuff that we love talking about here on the channel, whether it's new Marvel movies, uh, new sequels, reboots, all of that stuff, the big director stuff, we've got Christopher Nolan coming at us, Basically, plenty of content that will fill up the weeks ahead and give us plenty to talk about. That being said, we're going to start things off by talking about a movie that you can't see in the cinemas at all, which pretty much makes sure everything that I just said irrelevant to what we're going to talk about now. Uh, but it's something that we talk about here on this uh, show a lot in terms of remakes. Uh, but basically, we're going to review today Peter Pan and Wendy, the newest Disney live action movie that has released exclusively on Disney Plus. Uh, so if you have Disney Plus, awesome. If you don't, I guess what I'm about to talk about is irrelevant. Um, it's in the series of Disney taking those classic animated movies that everybody loves and cherishes and turning them into live action stories to uh, very varied results. Uh, now here on Splice in Later, we tend to give these uh, more mercy than a lot of reviewers do. I don't think that a lot of these movies get the hate that they deserve Because uh, they don't at the end of the day. I think it's hard though because yeah, sure These movies are remakes of classic animated movies So a lot of people going to see this stuff will not be able to shake off the This isn't as good as the thing I like and that's absolutely fair but at the same time, a lot of these movies are dead on arrival because of that love for those old Disney classics. But Podcorn and the Kettle Black, it really is down to your what is your favorite Disney animated film because that is going to determine how you receive these movies and to what degree. Yes, I sit here and I'm like, okay, come on, let's let's give these movies a pass. They're not going to be the animated Disney movies that we remember. But they're not bad movies, they're competent, they're well-made movies. But my favorite Disney animated film is Mulan. And the Mulan film came out in 2020 and I trashed it. And I still do, I think it's the worst, one of the worst things I've ever seen. Uh, a friend of mine loves Aladdin, the animated movie. So trashes that Aladdin live action movie. Even though me personally, don't think it's particularly that bad. So it, it, it's, it's not consistent. It really is going to be how much you like the product that is being adapted and how well you can detach from that to appreciate what's in front of you. But also inconsistently, these movies are not all the same. They vary very differently when in terms of how they're going to tell the animated story in live action format. Some movies are beat for beat the same exact movie, just retelling it on a live action scale. Specifically movies like Beauty and the Beast uh, or The Lion King. Yes, that is going to be difficult then for people to detach from the original when you are just doing the same movie again. Then you'll have some which will deviate wildly from the source material to varying degrees of reception. Uh, it can be really successful like The Jungle Book, probably the gold standard of live action Disney remakes in 2016. Um, it can be, at least for me personally, really successful. I personally really like the live action Dumbo because I think they did a lot for what was essentially just a 62 minute movie. Or again, Pot Calling the Kettle Black, they've differentiated wildly with how they did Mulan and I absolutely hate that. Or they'll do things just different enough, but still have the heart of the Disney in there. And again, it depends fully on your ability to let go and appreciate it. I think they made Aladdin just different enough with Will Smith's interpretation of the genie that I don't mind it. Um, I personally don't think the Pinocchio movie that came out last year is that bad, uh, but it's also not that good. But it, it sort of does things a little different, just not executed in that way. 
Uh, so where does Peter Pan and Wendy come into that? Probably somewhere in the middle, just above competent, above average, I think. In terms of live action Disney's, it's not their worst, um, but it's probably not their best. It's a mixed bag, and it's a movie that suffers from things that plague big blockbuster Hollywood stuff where they take a competent, fantastic director uh, who's very good at making niche, uh, independent, uh, unique films and say, okay, now make our big buck shit, big, big blockbuster Disney movie. Uh, but try and keep your vision, but also don't, which uh, has mixed results um, for sure. But uh, at the, uh, it's, it's also very boring when it sticks to the content, when it tries to do something different, it doesn't quite stick the landing because it's not confident to embrace its new vision. And that in itself is probably the best way to sum up Peter Pan and Wendy. All right, but let's get into the review here. So Peter Pan and Wendy, it's been released on Disney Plus, is directed by David Lowry, who directed The Green Knight. If you've listened to this show, you know that The Green Knight is a fantastic movie and something that I really, really, really love. It is a live action remake of the 1953 version of Peter Pan's Disney, Peter Pan's Disney, Disney's Peter Pan, but it's not locked in step with that interpretation. I think in general, it's a remake or a retelling of the Peter Pan story, uh, which relies on that Peter Pan Disney version, but also pulls in elements from the storybook, from other interpretations of Disney Pan. Disney Pan, oh my God, is this gonna happen for the whole episode? We'll see. So it's not lockstep with that Disney. I think that's why it's called Peter Pan and Wendy. It's sort of like saying it's the Peter Pan story, but it's not exclusively the version that you remember from from the Disney version. That said, I think the Disney version really influences any sort of retelling of Peter Pan in general. Peter Pan and Wendy uh, implies that it's both of them are the protagonists here and they're both getting the spotlight here. But I would argue this movie is basically about Wendy. Peter Pan is in the movie. Uh, he's a plot point. Uh, he's obviously instrumental for how things happen in the movie, but there's not an emphasis on him as the main character of the story. Certainly, uh, they do some stuff with Peter Pan here, which is very different for from what you probably remember of Peter Pan, or maybe not. If you go back and watch that old Peter Pan, he may not be the heroic person that you remember. He might just be a brat. Uh, in essence, though, Wendy's also a bit of a brat in here, uh, but she's definitely more of the of the of the protagonist here in the movie. But you could argue as well that the movie should be called. Peter Pan and Wendy and Captain Hook, because there's also a lot going on with Captain Hook here that I quite like, but we'll get into that. Basically, the movie for the first half is lockstep with the Peter Pan story. You know, it starts off with Wendy Darling and her brothers, John and Michael, farting around in their um, London, London apartment in Victorian times, uh, head in the clouds, full of imagination, all their, all their adventures of Peter Pan that they've been told by their mother means they stay up at night playing games, pretending to be Peter Pan. Um, the implication from their father, though, is that it's time to grow up. I will say, though, they step away from the whole Peter Pan legend, especially on plays or in the old-time Peter Pan Disney, where their father and Captain Hook are voiced by the same person. The idea being that... Your interpretation of Peter Pan is, did it all actually happen? Was it real? Was it fake? By their father and Captain Hook almost being the same character in terms of their mannerisms, their voice, the way they project themselves. Don't expect that in this movie though. Uh, for one thing, their father is played by Alan Turdick and Captain Hook is played by Jude Law. And also their father is kind of a nothing character. I think he shows up and goes, go to bed. And then off he goes. Uh, but. The implication here, especially for Wendy as she's being sent off to boarding school, is that it's time to grow up, to to move on into puberty or adulthood or whatever, leave behind those old fairy tale stories of Peter Pan. It's time to become active members of society, I guess. I don't know why the little boy with a bear should, uh, but to be fair, John and Michael are nothing characters in this movie. It's really Wendy, Wendy's story. So of course, as is the as is the legend, at night Peter Pan shows up, half chasing his shadow because it got away, ha, but half because he's been overhearing their story, their mother telling their stories, their love of 
being children. They said the official, I don't want to grow up, which means you can go to Neverland. So with Tinkerbell's uh, pixie dust and with the, with the happy thoughts, they get to fly off uh, into the sky over London. First start of the ride, straight on till morning, they're there in Neverland. But whoa -ho, uh, in Neverland are the pirates, Captain Hook and his first mate, Mr. Smee, who has basically a blood, blood pact to take down Peter Pan. Um, Hook is not the goofy one that you remember from Peter Pan. He is he's quite uh, scary, if he, as scary as you can get in a Disney movie, um, but is is determined to kill Peter Pan. What follows for the rest of the movie, though, it does deviate away from the source material. It takes a different approach with the story of Peter Pan and the story of Hook. Peter Pan is a brat. He does not care about Wendy, John and Michael. He doesn't really care about the Lost Boys. Uh, he barely cares about Tinkerbell. His whole thing is about not growing up and finding like-minded individuals to live on Neverland with him. There is also a reason for Captain Hook to be after Peter Pan besides just, I'm a pirate and that's what I do. Um, which is an interesting take that I kind of like, which is Captain Hook in this movie is sort of the first Lost Boy. He and Peter Pan lived on Neverland together, but Hook's big crime here is that he missed his mother and sort of wanted to go home. So take the implication of that what you will. Peter's version of their past and Hook's version of their past is very different. Whether he was cast out or he left willingly, doesn't really matter. But he left enough that he grew up and now he can't go back to Neverland because adults are not allowed. So he blames Peter and wants to go after him. Peter Pan in general is like, Hook's a bad pirate and I'm going to kill him because I'm Peter Pan. Yay! Uh, and sort of the movie then falls apart a bit after that because it doesn't really know what to do for the next half of the movie. It's trying to be different enough from Peter Pan, but it doesn't take advantage of kind of... First of all, it doesn't take advantage of its director and it doesn't take advantage of the setting of Neverland. I sort of realized as the movie was going along that they never really, and to be fair, no other movie has really done this with Peter Pan. They've never really taken advantage of Neverland. Neverland is certainly a place, and it's a place that all these people are interacting with each other, where it's Peter Pan and the Lost Boys, or Captain Hook and the Pirates, or Wendy and her brothers, uh, or Tiger Lily and her tribe, or, or, or whatever's going on there. But Neverland as a, con as a place doesn't really do anything. It's sort of like, it's a place we can go, but it's not a fantastical place. It's not like, oh, wow. Uh, I think the closest that ever did something with Neverland is Hook, the Robin Williams movie. And even then, it's not quite there. And it's really adamant in this movie, the way that uh, Wendy and friends arrive in Neverland. They have an adventure with Hook. They go stay at the Lost Boys tree. And then they're back on the pirate ship for a majority of the rest of the movie. So Neverland as a concept is flimsy. But credit where credit's true, David Lowry's direction is quite nice because it's not reliant on green screen. There's a lot of really nice establishing shots of Neverland, which is sort of, uh, I, I don't know where they shot it. It, it reminds me of like English, English hills or, or Scottish highlands or something like that. But the thing is that so many movies rely on green screen so much that it's very adamant in this movie Oh yeah, they're shooting it outside. They're shooting it in real places. Wendy's lying on an actual beach, uh, which is quite refreshing and I quite like. Um, overall, as I said at the start of this thing, Peter Pan and Wendy is one of the better Disney live actions, but not by a lot. It's above average. Where it suffers is I really hate Peter Pan and I kind of hate Wendy, but I guess that's by design of the movie because it's supposed to be, they don't want to grow up but in essence that makes them bratty. I really could not connect with Peter Pan. And in a sense I could connect with Wendy because she at least uh, goes on a, a journey in this movie to learn that yes, she does need to grow up, but that doesn't mean she needs to let go of her youth. She can find a nice balance. Peter Pan is stuck because he can't uh, grow and change because he has to go back to Neverland, I guess. Even at the end of the movie, there's a sense like, ah, oh, Peter Pan could grow. He, we could learn where he came from and what's going on there. 
but no, because we have to sit to the status quo that Peter Pan must remain in Neverland. It's kind of where that crazy movie Pan fell down, uh, where you do sort of get a hint of, oh yeah, this is where Peter Pan came from, but when you lock a character in to be, I don't ever want to grow up, and the whole emphasis of I don't grow up means he cannot embrace maturing, means he's stuck being this bratty character, and I really didn't like him. That's not a reflection on the actors. You're locked into this very specific way of telling the story, so they can only do so much with the character. Where the movie is saved 100% is Jude Law's interpretation of Captain Hook. As I've said in the past, Captain Hook is one of my all-time favorite Disney villains because I love his over-the-top villainous goofiness that you get in that old Disney movie. I like his whole PTSD with the crocodile that took his hand. I kind of like his weird uh, relationship with Mr. Smee where he hates him, but he also really needs him. Uh, I read somewhere that, oh yeah, the thing that saves this movie is Captain Hook and Mr. Smee's relationship. I don't think so. Mr. Smee in here is played by Jim Gaffigan. Uh, he's nowhere near the Smee that I know and love from the original Disney Peter Pan. Uh, but he's also not sort of, he does not have that relationship with Hook that is that you would think is implied. There's the sense that, oh yeah, I saved Hook when he was drowning and took him in and taught him to be a pirate. But there's too many questions there about where the pirates came from. Are pirates lost boys that tried that left and then can't go back? Or are they just generally pirates? Like, who is Mr. Smee? Why was he hanging around outside Neverland? With Hook, what I like about Jude Law's portrayal is he's like, I can't capture that, that cartoony Hook because Dustin Hoffman did it perfectly in Hook. So I have to do my own interpretation of it that fits David Lowry's direction here, which really is interesting with that whole concept of Hook and Peter Pan's backstory. Hook is a tragic figure here where you sort of like, okay, he's a bad guy, but is he bad for bad sake or is he bad because people screwed him over, namely Peter Pan? And Jude Law's tragic sense in the way that he portrays him, like he's sinister, he'll kill his own pirate crew, he'll drown boys because he doesn't want them to grow up because he hates children. It's all rooted in this in this backstory with Peter Pan, which unfortunately we're alluded to, but we don't get a lot of because they still have to play it safe and make sure that Peter Pan is the hero of the story. I would have loved if this movie had gone, Peter Pan is the bad guy and Hook is the good guy. Is that my bias in coming in from the fact that I love that ridiculous show Once Upon a Time that was on ABC and one of the best seasons of Once Upon a Time was season three. The first half being Peter Pan is actually this demented demon that steals children and wants people doesn't want people to grow up because, you know, he's sinister. And Captain Hook, played by Colin O'Donoghue, turned out to be this really cool, slightly shifty, but an honorable pirate who hates Peter Pan because Peter Pan sucks. And that's kind of what you have here. It's just not elaborated on enough. At the end of the day, Peter Pan and Wendy is certainly not terrible. I really appreciate David Lowry's direction. I really appreciate them trying to do something different with the Captain Hook character and his backstory of Peter Pan. I really appreciate not suiting on a green screen. And I really appreciate at the second half of the film where they try to do something different. Where the movie falls down is really unlikable protagonist. Peter Pan sucks. I don't like him. Wendy, for the most part, sucks. I don't like her. The first half of the movie is play-by-play, -play, the Peter Pan story you remember, so it's hard to get into it because you're just seeing stuff you've seen before. Uh, Michael and John, unfortunately, are nothing characters because they're not elaborated on because it's more all about or about Wendy's story. Uh, but... There's some good stuff here with the direction of David Lara. There's some good stuff here with you, Lost Betrayal of Hook. I kind of like The Lost Boys. The Lost Boys is a unique take in that they're not cartoon characters. You can see the group of Lost Boys that they've got are from a variety degree of, of, of cultures, um, of mannerisms. There's a nice representation of the Lost Boys and none of them are annoying, which is quite good. Um, I think at the end of the day, you will not suffer watching the movie, 
but you're not going to remember it. It's not going to insult you unless you love Peter Pan because Peter Pan is a brat. So you're going to watch this and go, why is he sucky in this? Overall, Peter Pan and Wendy gets a 6 out of 10 from me. It's perfectly fine. It's perfectly acceptable. It's kind of what you would expect for a live action Disney film that does not feel confident enough to embrace the cinemas. And it's just like, here it is on Disney+. Plus. It's saved by Jude Law's performance. It's saved by David Lowry's direction. But it's not going to be something that you're going to walk away from and go, that was unique and interesting from Disney. Uh, especially if The Little Mermaid, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, is able to prove that these this is the reason why live actions, some go to theaters and some don't. That said, I like it more than the Super Mario Brothers movie. Apparently, I'm in the minority on that one. So, there you go. Anyway, there you are. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed. What's more important is that I will be back 24 hours from... Well, not 24 hours from now. But I'll be back tomorrow at some point because Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 drops. And I'm very excited to review that for you. The Marvel movies from the MCU have been hit and miss recently. But James Gunn's direction, those Guardian characters, I'm fairly confident that it's going to be good. Is it going to be the best movie of the year? Boy, I hope so. But you'll just have to tune in tomorrow to see. Either way, thank you very much for listening. I love and appreciate you. Uh, what can I say? If you've got Disney Plus and you want to watch Peter Pan and Wendy, I don't think you'll waste your time. I am curious to see what other people think about the movie. Unfortunately, most of my friends don't watch movies unless they want to. Uh, and they don't want to watch this one. So I won't have anyone to talk about it with for a while. So we'll see. Either way, I'll be back tomorrow for G-O-T, G-O, G-O-T, G, Vol 3, because that's going to be great. And I hope you all will tune in to listen to that. Uh, until then, I love and appreciate you as always. Keep been spiced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.